Is the fall of Bakhmuth inevitable? And will it really matter as anything more than just a symbolic victory at this point? Russia is supplying its troops via a long route from Syria through the Straits controlled by Turkey and into the Black Sea. There's another train derailment in Ohio as the United States economy teeters precariously on the edge of a recession, and China is investing heavily in its military. There's a lot to unpack in this news and a lot you need to know. Plus, I'm going to announce the winner of last week's giveaway and let you know how to enter this week's giveaway. So let's jump in. The Fall of Bakhmuth Much of war is a numbers game. The side with the most significant numbers tends to win the battle. Tech, weaponry, and munitions can sway the equation in favor of even a heavily outmatched defender or attacker, but it's still primarily a numbers game. Accepting that, it is becoming clear by the day that Bakhmut will likely fall to Russia in the coming days or weeks unless something really significant changes. The Wagner Group, Russia's mercenary, privately owned military's policy of executing anyone retreating or surrendering in its shocking disregard for losses, has sent wave after wave of poorly equipped conscripts and penal battalions against Ukrainian forces in Bakhmut. Now, the White House recently estimated about 30,000 Wagner fighters have been injured or killed in the months-long battle. Some recent intel has shown casualty estimates of Russian troops as high as almost 1,000 per day. Reported numbers lack credibility. The U.S. and other Western officials recently estimated that the number of total casualties in the Ukrainian conflict on the Russian side, including both the dead and the wounded, was approaching 200,000. Moscow last September reported under 6,000 deaths in the whole conflict. Ukraine, to be honest, is probably not faring much better either, but they simply do not have the population that Russia does. Again, it's a numbers game, and Russia is leveraging this to the fullest. Each wave seen through its stacked corpses along the city's north, east, and southern border steadily erodes at the Ukrainian army's personnel, their ammunition, and equipment. A Ukrainian commander said the situation in Bakhmut, the city in eastern Ukraine, is critical and that there are more Russian troops surrounding the city than there is ammunition to kill them all. Bit by bit and wave after wave, the Russian army has managed to close off all of Bakhmut, but one western road. The Ukrainian military detonated bridges and roads in the north and east to prevent the Russian army and the Wagner Group's advance. Now, the 16-square-mile city that once held a population of nearly 80,000 people is almost entirely reduced to rubble from nonstop Russian shelling. It's been referred to as a meat grinder of the war, and it has mainly become a symbolic win for both Ukraine and Putin. It's a sign of Ukrainian resistance. It's a sign of Russia's ability to win a war that has dragged on nearly a year longer than initially assessed. The battle ties up Russian forces and likely prevents them from launching a more prominent offensive, even as it drains Ukrainian forces and really prevents them from going on the offense. But will either side holding Bakhmut be anything of a win in the overall conflict? Probably not. The French city of Fleury de Vent du Amont was reduced to rubble during World War I, and it changed hands 16 times. The village was later declared to have died for France. It was never rebuilt. Bakhmut will likely follow that same fallowed route when it all is said and done. In 2014, the city was briefly held by Russian separatists. It came under intense Russian shelling starting in May of last year, and the bombardment hasn't eased since then. The city holds very little strategic importance, but Ukrainian President Zelensky has signaled in recent speeches that Ukrainian forces may be forced to withdraw. The Wagner Group has claimed to have practically surrounded the city. For today, Bakhmut holds block by block as the Wagner Group tries to push its way into the city center. Now, the fall of Bakhmut has been predicted for more than six months, but still it holds. Still, cracks in Russian military strength may be enlarging daily without a victory in possession of the city. Yegeny Prigozhin, the founder of Russia's Wagner Mercenary Group, has recently criticized and complained bitterly for weeks about the regular Russian army and Kremlin leadership not recognizing, not respecting, and supporting his Wagner's group's contribution to the war effort in Bakhmut. Recently, his representative was reportedly denied access to Russia's military command headquarters in Ukraine. Prigozhin said in the video, apparently filmed in a bunker, if Wagner retreats from Bakhmut now, the whole front will collapse. The situation will not be sweet for all military formations protecting Russian interests. Some speculate that Prigozhin's recent comments are an attempt not to be scapegoated for a failure to secure a win, as he complains, too, about not being supplied with the quantity of munitions needed to secure a victory. The extent of rift between the Wagner Group and the regular Russian army, it remains to be seen. It remains to be seen how long Bakhmut will hold. 
having given up and effectively being banned from recruiting in prisons, the Wagner Group has recently founded youth clubs in St. Petersburg aimed at fostering patriotism and preparing young Russians for military service. The human cost of the war to Russia appears to be much larger than the few thousand estimated by the Kremlin. They may be starting to show a real manpower crisis that could manifest in low morale and an unwillingness to fight or surrender when Ukrainian forces make a Western armed supported offensive strike. What do you think? Will the flood of Western supplies and armaments get to Ukrainian soldiers there to turn the tide of this battle, or will the city fall in mere days? Let us know your thoughts in the comments section below. Russia. Support for Russia is arriving via a ship owned by a Russian shipping company. The ship, loaded with weapons and military equipment in Syria and sailing with a Russian Navy escort, slipped quietly into the Black Sea in the dead of night. Now, the vessel is expected to unload in a base that is still 200 plus kilometers from Crimea, but close enough that we may see these unknown weapons and munitions on the battlefield in the next couple of weeks. Turkey had previously closed two of their straits to warships, but that restriction did not apply to warships returning to their base in the Black Sea. So while it limits Russian supply efforts, it doesn't eliminate them altogether. Reports indicate that Russia is having tremendous difficulty securing the tech and materials it requires to keep its war machine moving. Foreign suppliers of crucial aircraft are hesitant to provide for Russia amidst sanctions. The Russian military has long relied on foreign source contracts and components to build its military equipment. New equipment is proving more challenging to be sourced, and equipment already in use requires continual maintenance and a steady supply of replacement parts. Though contracts are still being inked, as we reported last week, with the India-Russia T-90 battle tank DIL, the DILs and parts are far more challenging to come by under the current sanctions. Russia has also reported selling India and North Korea portable anti-aircraft missile systems. I mentioned this India-Russia battle tank deal again because of its significance. India claims this agreement is to offset Pakistan's 1996 purchase of 320 T-80 UD tanks from Ukraine. So the pieces of the current Ukraine-Russia-NATO conflict have been moving around the geopolitical chessboard for probably 30 years or more. The more you really research these things, the more you realize there has been a slow buildup of and to the current conflict. Russia needs tacit support from India and China to garner a victory in Ukraine and remain a viable and unbroken force on the world stage. And the problem is that China and India have long had a rising conflict of their shared border. India has also had a long-standing, since the 1940s, conflict on its western border with Pakistan. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov recently stated that Russia wants India and China to be friends. Russia will do anything and promise anything at this point to keep the countries from fighting. China has recently closed massive energy deals with Russia at significantly reduced and beneficial prices. India's Russian oil imports also hit a record high last month, more than Iraq and Saudi Arabia combined, India's traditional suppliers. Now, before the war, Russia supplied less than 1% of India's oil. Now that number is up to over a third of the country's imported oil. India doesn't pay in rubles or dollars for discounted Russian crude, but in dirham, the currency of the United Arab Emirates. It's clear that there will be a concerted Russian effort to build an alliance between these three superpowers, India, China, and themselves. India and China comprise 2.8 billion of the world's 8 billion people. So their support and friendship are critical to whoever will emerge victorious in Ukraine. Now, at the same time, the Western NATO forces are eager to push back against reports that they are weakening in their resolve. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz said the onus for ending the war in Ukraine remains on Russian President Vladimir Putin. He stated clearly that Germany would continue to support Ukraine with financial, humanitarian aid, but also with weapons. He reiterated the stance that no talks of peace would occur so long as Russian troops remain in Ukraine, stating Putin has to withdraw troops. This is the basis for talks. Now, at the same time, German defense contractor Rheinmetall is negotiating to build a tank factory that could produce 400 Panther tanks per year in Ukraine. Such a plant would be months from breaking ground and a year or more from actually rolling tanks out, but it underscores the level of support of NATO countries for Ukraine. Now, the UK has pledged to provide Ukraine twice as many Challenger 2 tanks as initially committed. All of the dedicated equipment in transit is a race against warmer weather and the heating of the spring conflict. The Western alliance continues to one-up each other to show their ongoing and unwavering support for Ukraine. The EU will spend 1 billion euros in the next few months to partially reimburse member countries for the cost of donated ammunition. Groups of the bloc states would then place fresh joint orders with arm manufacturers to boost the supply and replenish their stocks. Now, the U.S. committed another military aid package to the tune of $400 million for Ukraine. 
including armored vehicles that can launch 60-foot bridges to allow Ukrainian forces to assault Russian forces across river barriers in the spring. After a brief meeting last week at the group of 20 nations meeting in New Delhi, U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken and Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov met for the highest level talks between the two countries since Russia invaded Ukraine a year ago. No real headway was made toward a lasting peace. Blinken said he told Lavrov the U.S. would continue to support Ukraine for as long as it takes. Lavrov did not mention the meeting at his news conference after the meeting. He merely emphasized that Russia would continue to press its action in Ukraine. While the U.S. has not publicly committed to providing F-16s to Ukraine, it was revealed that two Ukrainian pilots are in the United States for training assessment on attack aircraft, including F-16s. The U.S. is assessing their skills and how long it would take to have to train Ukrainian pilots on the high-tech jets. Officially, the pilots aren't being trained on the equipment and there has been no material commitment. However, training the Ukraine military in other countries has been a reliable way to prop up Ukraine defenses. The U.S. is calling it a familiarization event. It doesn't include that the F-16 will be on the battlefield in the near future, but it is undeniably waiting in the wings as a plan B final means of defending Ukraine. That should be cause for alarm for Russia, and we will likely see some pushback from Russia in the coming days and weeks. What do you think? Will these munitions and equipment make it to Ukraine in time, or will it be too late? Let us know your thoughts in the comments section below. United States there's been another significant train derailment in Ohio again with the Norfolk Southern train. Now, officials have said that the train that went off the tracks near Springfield, Ohio, this second one, was not carrying hazardous materials. 20 cars derailed and also knocked out power for more than 1,500 county residents. Part of that train, but fortunately not the part that derailed, were several cars carrying liquid propane and others carrying ethanol. If any of these had derailed, we would have had significantly different news today. The incident comes on the hills of the February 3rd derailment of a Norfolk Southern train on the opposite side of the state and has to be leaving everyone across the country living near a railroad to wonder how safe they really are. In a letter sent to Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg by Ohio Governor Mike DeWine on behalf of the Teamsters, many employees reported that they were continuing to experience migraines and nausea days after the derailment, and they all suspect that they were willingly exposed to these chemicals at the direction of Norfolk Southern. We will clearly continue to hear about concerns over rail safety, worker safety, and infrastructure horror stories into the foreseeable future. Inflation continues to impede the U.S. economy. The S&P 500 and NASDAQ fell for a second straight session on Wednesday as Treasury yields jumped after manufacturing data indicated inflation is likely to remain stubbornly high. At the same time, comments from the Federal Reserve policymakers supported a hawkish policy stance. Reported unemployment numbers remain low, though there is some questioning of their accuracy in reflecting the realities of an increasingly gig-oriented economy in factoring and recent job hopping. Not all agree that we're in a recession at the moment, but all agree on the single-digit rise in inflation, which is double-digit on many of the things that we consume daily. The hopes for a soft landing to avoid a deep recession are still there, and they get a little more solid each day that a deep and dramatic dive is averted. Businesses and consumers have proven surprisingly resilient despite soaring prices and interest rates. Still, 58% of economists who recently responded to a survey by the National Association for Business Economics envision a recession sometimes this year. We're far from avoiding a derailment of the U.S. economy, so you should continue to prep and use your preps as if a recession is inevitable. The fact is that the Fed has never managed to really reduce inflation from the high levels it has recently reached without causing some type of recession. So there is no reason to think that their hope for a soft landing is anything greater than just empty hope. Turning to the fundamental indicators of the economy's health, while demand for new home loans and refinances is the lowest in 22 years, loan servicing volumes are near pre-pandemic levels as borrowers have been exiting forbearance programs. And guess what? Foreclosure proceedings are now up 132%. Also, the share of subprime auto debt that was 30 or more days delinquent jumped to nearly 10%. Clearly, even though the economy is holding fast at the moment, some cracks are beginning to reveal themselves to the average consumer. You have probably undoubtedly felt the inflationary pressures with every purchase this year. I'll post a link to a free recession-proof guide that we created a while back, and I would encourage you to download and check it out to help you really prepare your finances to survive any significant economic downturn. 
Now, for this week's giveaway, we're going to be giving away a Fisker's hatchet. And to be eligible for a chance of winning this giveaway, just simply post a comment below, click the like button, and next week, I'll use a tool to draw a winner from the comments on this video randomly. And I'm not going to reach out to you unless your name appears on the screen next week. And you must have your email address listed on your About tab of your YouTube profile. So please ignore and report any comments telling you that you've won or to contact me through WhatsApp or Telegram because it is not me. Now, for the last week's winner of the professional folding saw, the winner is a subscriber, Juju Mama. I'll reach out to you shortly to get that sent to you. China. Finally, in the news on China, the country has increased its military budget by $230 billion, a 7.1% increase. China's pledge to boost combat preparedness reverses a two-decade trend of prioritizing growth over defense. Now, Taiwan already equipped with ground systems, air defense missiles, and F-16 fighters, Taiwan extended mandatory military service from just four months to one year and has been revitalizing its defense industries, including building submarines for the first time. Now, China has continued to eye Africa. They've established a base in the Horn of Africa, and as I reported last week, they're refurbishing Cambodia's Ream Naval Base. They clearly intend to dominate and control the South China Sea and surrounding areas. And while China claims to be committed to an independent foreign policy of peace, the country also calls for resolute steps to oppose Taiwan independence. As China's parliament continues to discuss the One China Principle and its policies for resolving the Taiwan question, it is becoming more clear to many that they are building a military that they will deploy based on the relative success or failure of Russia's endeavors in Ukraine. Every day that brings the two countries into alignment and independent of Western sanctions, influence, or breakdowns of trade is one day, in my opinion, closer to China's actions against Taiwan. Perhaps this same assessment is what has Finland seeking to reduce economic dependence on China. It is estimated that half of the mobile phones and two-thirds of all the laptops used in Finland are produced in China. Finland is searching for alternate sources of raw materials as well. And the U.S. has already significantly hampered China's growth through the Chips and Science Act, which will create some 23,000 new jobs, providing $280 billion in new funding and incentives, and has already resulted in the groundbreaking for several U.S. manufacturing facilities across the nation. Clearly, many countries are really beginning to seek to keep their tech advances closer to home as a means to suppress China's aspirational territorial growth. That pressure may be working to at least keep China out of the direct support of Russia and Ukraine. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz on Sunday said that China had declared it won't supply Russia with weapons for its war against Ukraine, suggesting that Berlin has received bilateral assurances from Beijing on this issue. Still, stymieing the flow of tech to China has proven to be a sticky and complicated issue. The Biden administration approved 192 licenses worth over $23 billion to ship U.S. goods and technology to Chinese companies on a U.S. trade blacklist in the first quarter of last year, according to the document released by the United States House of Representatives Foreign Affairs Committee. If there is one thing in the United States politics that is still nonpartisan, it appears to be the general unification around choking off the sale of tech to China. Under the Trump administration, there was a curb on exports of semiconductors and other equipment exports. And under the Biden administration, the Chips and Science Act was finally signed. That unified, nonpartisan position is a bright light in the otherwise divided political climate. We will continue to monitor these issues that are happening around the world, and I hope that they really help you inform your prepping decisions. Again, as I say every week, I know there's a lot happening. I know there's a lot to be concerned about. I share that sentiment. There's a lot of things that I realize I need to work on at a new level that things I thought, hey, maybe I've got six, nine, 12 months. I'm starting to move those timelines to be shorter on my list of things to do. Again, I would encourage you to stay encouraged. Don't give in to fear. Don't go out and make rash decisions. Run up credit card debt. Do what is within your means. Stay within your financial means. I would encourage you to set a budget as I know so many are probably wanting to go and buy a bunch of stuff that they may or may not need. And if you are committed to making purchases, you can't go wrong buying food, storing away shelf-stable food that you could use if there's some event in the future. Again, I hope you have, uh, I hope this gives you insight. That's always my hope with these videos. If you have any thoughts or feedback, feel free to post those below in the comment section. As always, stay safe out there.